Praise the Lord, everybody. So good to be in the house of the Lord again today. Amen. God is a good God. Even on a bad day, He's a good God. But we are gathered into His house today. This is the day that the Lord has made. The psalmist said, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I've made a decision today to rejoice in this day. I've made the decision to come with a heart full of thanksgiving and praise. I've made a decision to give him my best here today. To be ready for the preaching of the word of God. Anybody else hungry to give God praise here today? He deserves to hear it. Why don't you just do that right now? Can somebody lift up your voice and exalt him? Oh, can you praise his name today? Can you exalt him? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, we worship you today. Hallelujah. Have your way in this place. Prepare our hearts to hear and receive the word of God. Do a work in this place today. Move in this house, mighty God. We give you the thanks and the glory for it. Oh, let's worship the Lord today. He's worthy to be praised. Psalms 84 verse 8 says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Give the Lord praise.
thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. We sing that song a lot of times and talk about what the highest praise is. You know, the Bible says, uses the word hallelujah, which depending on who you talk to, that means a thousand praises or ten thousand praises. But I tell you what, what would be really good today is if we just think about something he did for us this week and give him real praise for it. Hallelujah. Give him real thanksgiving. He deserves it here today. Oh, come on, somebody give him thanksgiving for his blessings. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We live in an ungrateful society, but that ought not be how the church operates. Amen. We ought to live in an overabundance of thanksgiving, an overabundance of appreciation. Hallelujah. Thanksgiving. You didn't do one thing. You couldn't earn your way into this, but God opened the door. He gave every one of us access. It was undeserved. We were unworthy, unqualified. Hallelujah. But he made a way. He made a way. Praise the Lord. I feel like giving him praise here today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to change the order of this service and uh, make this offering time here today as the musicians play and they sing. Let's bring our tithe and offering. Let our classes be dismissed. In Jesus' name. Worship him here today. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. If you've ever been saved or rescued from a life threatening situation, you could never forget that incident or the person that helped you out. Can anybody think about anything that the Lord has done for you? As we've already heard, not just this week but when he brought you out when he saved you when he delivered you when he set you free Jesus I'll never forget how could I forget hallelujah hallelujah oh let's worship him and glorify him again today everybody thank God thank God amen so good to be in the house of the Lord again on this beautiful Sunday morning, good to see everybody that's in the house of God, especially our guests. Let's make them feel welcome this morning.
and uh, we still have some sickness to contend with, but we're glad to see all of our church family members that are here, some that haven't been able to come in a while. Always good to see our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we want to pray for those that could not be here today. And uh, of course, continue to pray for missionaries around the world, that God would help them, direct them, and give them a great revival in this year, 2023, and right here also in Conyers, Georgia. Uh, we want to see a mighty move of God, and we believe that we are and will. And if you are in the Conyers or Rockdale County or Atlanta metro area, we invite you to come and be a part of one of our services. On Sundays, generally, we have service in the morning at 10 a.m., 6 in the evening, and then Wednesday night Bible class at 7.30. We invite everybody in the community to come and be with us. And I'm saying this, of course, for the benefit of those that are maybe following the service online, 1882 Irwin Bridge Road, right here in Conyers, beautiful facility. And we're again glad to have those that are visiting with us today. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help us in the remainder of this service to be again with those that could not be here and that the Lord would, uh, would help us as a church to be everything he wants us to be in this community, in this area, and for those that need God and want God. I believe there's some hungry people out there, people who, uh, you know, not everybody's enjoying the pleasures of sin. Some people are miserable, and they want to change, and they're looking for direction. We need to pray that God would help us to reach them or bring them in contact with us and see souls saved and changed uh, by the power of God. You believe that the Lord is able? Let's go to him right now. Lord, we thank you again for the privilege of being in your house one more time and grateful for your blessings upon us this past week, all that you've done and are doing for us. We thank you for those of our church family who have been afflicted but were able to uh, be in service today. Pray that you would continue to give them healing and strength and especially for those that still could not be here, that you would touch them and strengthen them and, uh, and, and restore them to complete health. Everybody present or absent that needs healing today, that healing would flow into our bodies. We pray for all of those that may be watching and listening to this service online, that you would also meet their needs supply them according to your riches and glory not only physical but financial material most of all spiritual we pray also for the missionaries around the world that are laboring some of them in very difficult circumstances and dangerous situations that you would meet their needs and help them watch over them protect them open doors for them Grant them a great harvest of souls and do the same right here in Conyers, Georgia. Lord, would you save many lives, many souls in this community and our surrounding area in this year of 2023. Let your will be done in the remainder of this service today. We'll praise and thank you and glorify you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. Turn to what is for many of us a familiar passage this morning in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And uh, let's read here the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Amen. I just, uh, this is kind of a familiar ground for some of us, but I felt that it would be good to look at again as we're in these early days of uh, 2023. 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, 
came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. It's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, contrary to our faith to admit that sometimes uh, there is weakness and sometimes there is fear and sometimes there is trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught or to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. My subject is simple today. I want to talk to you uh, about you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Put your Bibles down and give the Lord another hand clap of praise, if you would, before we're seated this morning. Come on, let's do this the Bible way. Open your mouth and praise him while you clap your hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise and victory and glory today. He's worthy. He's worthy. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, we serve a God today that is full of secrets and surprises. We don't know everything there is to know about God, and we have not seen everything that he cannot do. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament observed, Verily, thou art a God that hideth thyself, O God of Israel. It seems that way at times, uh, but and nonetheless, uh, the revelation of himself is progressive and gradual in some senses, as uh, Isaiah also said in the 28th chapter and the 13th verse, he said that he uh, makes himself known to us and his ways line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Uh, if you've been living for God any length of time, I think you can agree with me that your understanding and comprehension of God has not come all at once, but it has come gradually and uh, it has evolved over time as your relationship uh, with him has grown. But the more that we find out about God, the more we realize remains to be discovered. A lifetime of learning concerning God will still yield a confession of total ignorance from the student. I remember being with one of my uh, elders and mentors who has passed on now for a number of years. He had uh, a shelf that was full of Bibles that he had studied and worn out, annotated and underlined, and uh, the pages were dog-eared, and 
Uh, anytime that you saw him, he generally had a Bible laying open in front of him as he studied the Word of God. And he said to me, I was a young preacher at the time, and he was uh, older in age, and he said, you know, the thing that bothers me the most, he said, is that as I am entering the final phase of my life, I feel like I am still so ignorant about the things of God. That was after devoting his uh, entire life, decades of studying and learning about God. As Paul uttered in Romans 11 and verse 23, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Now, when the Bible said how unsearchable, it doesn't mean that you can never learn about him or know about him, but it just means you can never plumb the depths of it. You'll never reach the outer limits of the knowledge and the things of God. And when it says it's past finding out, it doesn't mean give up and don't even try. It means that no matter how much you do and how much you search, you will never ever reach the depths or limits of his knowledge. To put it in perspective, uh, many stars out in the universe are millions of times larger than our own sun. And yet they are out there so far away that they appear to be a little tiny speck out in the vast expanse of space. And uh, as we look at them uh, and that tiny little dot that they represent, we have no real concept of the immensity of what we are looking at. And uh, we are prone then to perhaps sing the little song that children learn, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder uh, how you are. And so to us, it's a twinkling little star, but if we could see it in its true dimensions, we would be absolutely overwhelmed by its size and its mass. And so similarly, all our a collective knowledge of God is like a child looking at that immense star and saying, twinkle, twinkle, little star. As we sit here in the house of God, whatever the level of our comprehension of God is, it is extremely minute and small in relation to God's true dimensions. Praise the Lord. And so we have never even begun to scratch the surface of God's awesome power and strength. And when we think we've figured him all out and we have got him neatly confined in a box of our own comprehension, God will work in ways that we have never seen before. As he said in Isaiah 43 and 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Because as we have stated before, he is not limited to do what he has done before. He can do something that he has never done before. I want you to think with me for a few moments about uh, what he has done in the past and use that as a template for uh, what he is capable of doing now and in the future. And we have to begin, of course, as we often do with his creative works, whether it was the sun or whether it was the moon or the stars or the solar systems or the galaxies that are scattered across space. He created billions of celestial bodies and then scattered them out so far that you cannot even see them with a naked eye. And the more powerful telescopes that and instruments that man has been able to create and use them to look and gaze out there into space and even placed uh, uh, 
things out there like the Hubble telescope and other things so that they could see beyond the interference of the earth's atmosphere and look even farther out. And the more that they have been able to gaze out that they have still not found the edge of the universe. Every time they get something more powerful and can see farther, you know what they see? They see more and more of God's creative works that was hid from humanity for millenniums. And all that does is it testifies to the vast reserves of power and might that God has that has not even been tapped into until now. Praise the Lord. Whether it is a telescope or whether it is a microscope, when you look out at the vastness or when you get down into the tiny little building blocks of nature. You're amazed at the greatness and the power of the great God that we serve. Praise the Lord. Everything around us, he made it. He made every fish from the darting minnow to the Leviathan whale. He made every fowl of the air from the hovering hummingbird to the soaring eagle and condor. He made every reptile from the slithering snake, amen, to the shuffling alligator. Every insect from a buzzing bee to a a creeping tarantula. He made every beast of the field from a graceful gazelle to a lumbering elephant. He has made every plant, every flower, every tree, every mountain, every hill, every plain, every desert, every ocean, every lake, every river, every stream. God made it all. Come on, let's not take it for granted. The Bible said the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Get your eyes up off the ground. Get your eyes off your problem and fix them today on a God that is greater than our little human minds can ever comprehend. Give him another hand clap of praise. You understand that every creative act was a first. It had never been done before. And God did not have to consult a how-to manual. He didn't have to dig into dusty archives and find forgotten blueprints to figure out how to do it. God didn't have to read idiots guides on creation in order to know how to do it. Everything he did, he envisioned it, he designed it, he created it, and he made it. Down to the smallest atom and molecule holding it all together came from the great mind of the God we've been worshiping and singing about today, including our bodies that David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When you think about all the systems that function in our bodies that enable us to be able to act and interact and, and see and appreciate the world around us, the senses that we have, sight, Hearing, vision, taste, touch, everything, God gave it to us. He made man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Come on, let's think about God here today for a little bit. Somebody ought to praise him. Somebody ought to glorify him. Somebody ought to magnify him. And not just his creative works, but there are other things he did that are recorded in Scripture that had never been done before and maybe have never been done again the same way. And yet God showed that for whatever time and circumstance, he can do what he's never done. I said he can do what he's never done. We preached not long ago about Noah 
uh, when he was warned of God, the Bible said, of things not seen as yet. He moved with fear and built an ark to the saving of his house. When the Lord told him, you need to build a big boat because I'm fixing to flood this earth with water and you're going to need it if you're going to survive this experience. Noah didn't say, well, I've never seen it. I've, it's never happened. I've never heard of such a thing. I'm not going to uh, take this seriously. No, he immediately got busy because he knew if God said it, He's going to do it. Y'all didn't hear me. If God said it, he was going to do it. He didn't take his time. He didn't procrastinate. He didn't drag his heels. He moved with fear. Got with the program. Because he knew that what God had promised, he was able to perform. We've talked also recently about the great plagues that God visited upon the land of Egypt. Pharaoh had said when Moses came in and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is this God that I should obey him? And God God said to Moses, step aside, son. I'm fixing to introduce myself to this arrogant fool. And by the time it was over, he was saying, go, take your people, take your children, take your animals, take everything you have, and go and worship your God. Oh, my God is still on the throne. And I don't care how loud they holler and how much they rattle their sabers. My God is still in control today. Amen. You know the story how that when they went out, then they came to the Red Sea. And when they came to the Red Sea, there were mountains on either side and the enemy was behind them. And I heard somebody tell a story this week about a young boy that went home from Sunday school and his mama asked him, said, what did they teach you? What did you learn in class today? And he said, well, I learned about, about the Israelites coming to the Red Sea. And the mother said, oh yeah, well, uh, what happened then? And, and he said, well, um, Moses got some engineers together and they figured out how to build a bridge and, and they did this and that and whatever and, and eventually they crossed over uh, on that bridge and mother, of course, knew the story and she said, uh, now son, are you sure that that's what that teacher taught you? And he said, no, that's not what she said, but you're not going to believe what she said. Praise the Lord, because the Bible tells us that God opened up a path. You know what Moses said? Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord stretched his rod over that sea and those waters divided and they went across on dry land. Heard somebody else say, well, you know, some skeptics say that they crossed over in a place where the water was only a few inches deep and so it really wasn't that big of a deal and, somebody, and some preacher said, well, if, if that's what you believe, then it's still a great miracle because my Bible tells me he drowned the Egyptian army in the that sea. So God was able to drown a whole army in a few inches of water. He's still a great God. He's still a miracle working God. He's still a mighty God. But my Bible said the water was as a wall on either side of them. And they went across not in, in sludge and in mud, but on dry ground. Didn't even get their tootsies wet. Oh, my God is a great God today. Somebody ought to praise him. Got into the wilderness. No McDonald's. No Kroger's. No grocery stores. No quick stops. No 7-Elevens. Nowhere to buy food. No problem. My Bible said man did eat angels food. For a while, the Lord uh, uh, ushered a, a uh, order into heaven's kitchen and said, until further notice, whip up an extra batch and send down to those people in that wilderness. Millions of people ate manna for years going across the wilderness. 
Amen. What did it look like? What did it smell like? What did it taste like? Well, it might not have been all that impressive, but I'll tell you what, it had everything they needed to survive that wilderness. All of the vitamins and minerals and nutrients and moisture that the body needs to survive was encapsulated in that manna. You know why it was called manna? Because they said, what is this? That's what manna means. What is it? They never actually had a good name for it other than, what is it? Because they'd never seen it before. They'd, grandma had never cooked it before. They'd never eaten it in Goshen before. It was brand new to them. I'm telling you, whatever you need today to survive and get through your situation and your trial, heaven is able to provide it. Heaven is able to furnish it. Even when it comes to your financial and material needs or whatever it is that you need today, if God needs to, he can. He has not lost the recipe for manna. He can supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Somebody praise him today. So they got hungry for meat. They got to missing the meat. The manna was bland. And they remembered meat. What they were really missing, of course, was the, was the seasoned taste. And, and so they remembered the leeks and the onions and the melons and the garlic from Egypt. And so they wanted something seasoned and so they longed for meat and so God told Moses I'm going to give the people meat to eat and they're going to eat meat for a month and 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 you know Moses was skeptical after all he had seen God do Moses was skeptical and God responded by saying uh is the land is the Lord's hand waxed short are you, are you saying that I can no longer do what I said I will do? And so here comes a cloud out of the horizon, but instead of being a, a moisture cloud for rain, it's a cloud of quail flying low enough that they didn't need shotguns. They didn't need slingshots. They just stood right where they were and clubbed them down as they flew by. Imagine that. And when they were done, the quail, listen to this, the quail was laying on the ground about 44 inches deep, and a day's journey that way, a day's journey that way, that way, and that way, which is a distance of about 24 miles. 24 miles the quail was laying on the ground about 44 inches deep, enough for millions of people to eat meat, not just for one day, two days, three days, but for a whole month. And so I've never seen or heard of that before. It doesn't matter. If God said, I'm going to do it, he can do it. He doesn't have to have done it before. He can do it. And he did it then. And, and, I, and, and we wonder, can God supply your need? I'm telling you, God can supply your need. God can solve your problem. God can help you with your bills today. Put your faith and your confidence in God. Oh, I wish somebody would grab a hold of this in faith here today. Praise the Lord. I'm talking about you ain't seen nothing yet. Bible goes on to tell about a great battle that Joshua was leading the people of Israel in. And the Lord had promised that not one man of them would stand before them. There would be no survivors. And yet the day was about to end. Darkness was coming. And Joshua knew when darkness comes, the remnant are going to escape under the cover of darkness. And yet he knew the promise of God. God said, not one man, not one man. You're going to have a complete and total victory. So without hesitation, he didn't stop and have a consultation with God first. He didn't stop and say, now, Lord, uh, I know this never happened before, but would you back me on this? He just stopped right in the middle of the battle, pointed at the sun, and said, son, stand thou still. 
moon, don't you move either. And continued fighting. And the sun and the moon did not continue their course for the space of another day until Joshua had completely won the victory. Just like God had promised. God will alter the forces of nature to help his people if he needs to. Well, I never heard of such. It doesn't matter. It happened. The Bible said there's never been another day like it in all of history where the sun would stand still because a man filled with faith and a mighty God knew if God has to put the brakes on the whole solar system, he's going to help us get the job done. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me here today. Praise God. And the greatest miracle of all is one that we've preached about very recently here. And uh, we see the origins of it, or at least some of the origins of it, at a turbulent time in Israel's history. And, and uh, there was a king by the name of Ahaz who was being threatened by some enemies. And God sent the prophet Isaiah to him and said, If you don't think I can do this, then ask of me a sign. And Ahaz said, Oh, I, you know, far be it from me, a man, to ask of God a sign. And God said, All right, son, if you're not going to ask for a sign, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin is going to conceive and bring forth a son, and his name is going to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as we preached just last week, when the fullness of time was come, amen, that baby was born. Just like God said he would in circumstances that had never happened before. A virgin birth. Mary overshadowed by the Holy Ghost conceived and brought forth a son, a savior, a deliverer. And the world has never been the same since. And with the arrival of Jesus Christ upon this earth, the world saw miracles and signs and wonders on a scale it had never seen before. But that wasn't all there was to it. One day he carried his cross to Calvary's hill. And there he died and he shed blood that was immaculate, that was pure, that was untainted by sin, uncorrupted blood. He shed his blood on Calvary's hill so that we could be saved, we could be delivered, we could be healed. That's not all. After his body sagged in death, they took it down, amen, washed it, put it into a tomb, and three days later, three days later, something that had never happened before, a man got up on his own power and walked out of that grave, resurrected for all time. Say, that can happen. It's never happened. God said, if I said I'm going to do it, I'll do it. <laughs> Praise God. Put this body in the grave, and in three days, I'm going to raise it up. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, I'm only going to be in that grave three days. In fact, as we've preached before, Jesus gave death a four-point ultimatum that had never been given to death before. I don't care how tough you are, how, how wealthy you are, how influential you are. You can't talk to death like this. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I'll lay it down when I get ready. Number two, the skin worms will not touch my body. Number three, I'm only going to be there three days. And number four, I'll get up when I get ready. A four-point ultimatum to death, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Anybody who has that kind of clout and that kind of power over the grave and death 
itself. I'm telling you, he can help you with your life. He can help you with your situation. He can help you with your problems today. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. And after he rose again, amen, he gave his disciples a promise. Go tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Huh? Do what? Say what? Uh, what are we talking about? What's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? What's it going to sound like? Just go and wait. Just go and tarry. And so they obeyed him. You know, sometimes we just need to obey the Lord. Quit trying to analyze it. Quit trying to figure it out. Quit trying to break it down. Quit checking social media and all our friends and loved ones and getting other people's opinion. Let's just take God at his word. That's what they did. They went, to, they went back to that upper room and they were there for a number of days. They didn't know what was going to happen, how they would know if it happened or, or what was going to happen. They just, they just tarried and wait. But when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. This never happened before, but it's happening now. Amen. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Something that had never happened before was happening right there in their midst. Praise God, but I'm glad it didn't end there. I'm glad it didn't stop there. I'm glad it wasn't just for that 120. But as they came out of that upper room and they're shouting and worshiping and talking in tongues and getting people's attention saying, what meaneth this? What's this all about? We've never seen it happen like this before. And Peter jumped up and began to preach. These are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel saying, in the last days saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. I'm glad God's still pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. Anybody here this morning can say, I've been a recipient. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. I spoke in tongues just like they did. Praise God. You know what this really was? This was a mystery, the Bible says. In Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27, it speaks about the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is manifest or made known to his saints. What is that mystery that had been hid from ages and generations? Here it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. They didn't have that in the Old Testament, but we have it now. I said we have it. You know what the Holy Ghost is? It's more than just hippie-jibbies. It's more than just goosebumps and duck pimples. It's more than just a little shiver running up and down your spine. It's more than just juking and jiving and shouting and dancing. Even though all of that, you can have all of that when you're full of the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Almighty God living inside of us. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Christ in you, the hope of glory is the revelation of the mystery that had been hid from ages and generations but is now made manifest in the saints anybody thankful for the Holy Ghost here today praise God praise God hallelujah and so that's not all he also gave his disciples a promise before he went away in John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, Jesus talking to his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, I don't know if we should read this or not. I don't know if we should read this or not. Maybe there's too much unbelief in this house for us to read this this morning. But it is in the Bible 
Jesus did say this. Be as skeptical as you want to be. Be as much a doubter as you want to be. But he did say it. The works that I do shall he do also. I don't know if you can take this now. Fasten your seatbelts. We're fixing to hit a major air pocket. And greater works. I don't know if I can believe that. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he says it again, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now I'm just going to tell you this morning, I'm just dumb and simple enough to believe that if he could say I'm sending a flood like you've never seen, and he did it. And if he could say to Pharaoh, let my people go, and then visit them with ten plagues the world had never seen before, and he did it. And if he could divide the Red Sea and they walk across on dry land, if he could make the sun to stand still, if he could feed the people with manna and with quail, if he said, if you ask anything, I will do it. I'm going to be dumb enough to believe it. If that's called being dumb. If that's called being simplistic, then call me simplistic. I'm going to believe here in the early days of January 2023 that he meant what he said. He meant what he said. And greater works than these shall he do. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Which leads us then to the present. Here we are today. And we're functioning in a very complex world, the likes of which has never existed before. And uh, I read to you in this text, in this passage, in verse number 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, as we saw here, Paul is not writing an original text. He is quoting an ancient prophecy. As it is written, he said. As it is written, he said. He was quoting a prophecy that had been given between seven to eight hundred years before by none other than the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 64 and 4, it's written, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor per perceived by the ear Neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. That's the original promise in Isaiah 64 and 4. They've been waiting on that promise for centuries. Now the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, brings that promise into that present time. And he says, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. I want to submit to you this morning, many of you have already heard me say this many times before, but maybe not everybody. Paul was declaring that this promise was no longer future tense. But it was present. 
It was for here and it was for now. And still so many people read this verse today and their mind goes all the way into the future. Their mind goes into eternity. Their mind goes to heaven. And they start thinking about heaven. I have not seen, ear, not heard. And they write songs about it in relation to heaven and the future tense. I submit to you this morning that it's not talking about future tense. It's talking about now. When Isaiah wrote it, it was future. When Paul wrote it, it was present. How do I know that? By the next verse, number 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Heaven and eternity is not mentioned in this chapter. Paul is not writing about something way off in the future. He's saying what Isaiah said, it's for us right now. It's for us right here. Here we are 2,000 years later, and I'm standing before you today saying this promise is for us. It's for now. It's for here. It's for in our time. It's for 2023. What is it? I have not seen. Ears haven't heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man. What God has prepared for them that love him. I believe God wants to show out in 2023 in ways that none of us have ever seen before. Have ever heard of before. Have ever experienced before somebody shout to the Lord here today <laughs> praise God praise God amen I believe that God wants to reveal his power to us now today when we read the 11th chapter of Hebrews the so called heroes of faith and they were but this is what it says about them in the closing verses of that chapter. Verse 39, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. And this will blow your mind. Verse number 40, maybe it's been too long since some of us have read it. God, having provided somewhat, somewhat, better thing for us that without us should not be made perfect. Amen. Let me tell you something. God understands better than we do that the challenges of our time demands unprecedented operations. We're dealing with a rapidly changing world. Drastic changes in technology are happening all the time. Knowledge is increasing and accelerating exponentially. My sons introduced me in the last few days to a particular feature that is available on the internet right now that has access to all of the written knowledge uh, in the entire world that has been fed into uh, this, these massive computers and storage devices, and you can ask it any question. And of course, we've had that through the internet, but it will write essays for you. It will write songs for you. It will write poetry. It will even compose sermon outlines within a matter of moments. And educators in universities and colleges are saying already that it's going to totally revolutionize the way that they have to function because students are going to be able to just allow this thing to write whole thesis for them that they won't even have to study and read and write themselves. And this is just the beginning. It's just the door creaking open. And I could go on and give a whole lot more detail of everything that this is capable of right now. These are the times that we are living in. And they are the, these revolutions are happening all around us. 
Amen. And in the middle of it all, we are dealing with a shocking decay in our society in every way that you can imagine. Sin is abounding more and more. As we have often said, the dysfunctional has become the normal and the status quo in our world today. And here we are, the church in these last days. We don't need business as usual. We can have business as usual. Praise God. In fact, we can't have church as usual. When I say we can't have church as usual, it doesn't mean that we're going to abandon the uh, things about church that make church church. We're still going to worship. We're still going to pray. We're still going to preach. We don't need to dispense with the things that work. We're not going to take the pulpit away and replace it with dramas with shows, with entertainment. Y'all can relax about that as long as this man's still living and breathing. That ain't happening. We might occasionally have a program or something, but it'll never take the place of preaching because God ordained a long time ago that by the foolishness of preaching, he would save them that believe. We're not throwing preaching out the window. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to come in here dressed like a biker. We're not going to get so casual and so relaxed about the things of God that we're just going to come in here like we just strolled in out of a Starbucks coffee shop. I still believe that church demands our best. We should look our best when we come to church. We're coming to the house of God. That doesn't mean God can't bless you if you're in your work clothes. If you don't have time to clean up and change, and if, if that's the best you got, you can come any way that you are. But that doesn't mean we're going to approach the house of God in a relaxed, laid back, and indifferent manner. He's still a great God. He commands respect and reverence. Praise the Lord. And I'm just old school enough to believe that ministry should look like ministry act like ministry, sound like ministry. So I'm not going to come in here like, like I just, uh, you know, came in off of a safari somewhere. And, uh, and we're still going to approach church the right way. But when I say we can't afford to have church as usual, I mean that we can't just, we can't just accept, you know, three songs, offering, a little sermon and going home. We need to have a move of God. We need to have a move of God. We need to have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We need God to walk in this house. We need the Holy Ghost to deal with people's lives and hearts. We need a supernatural manifestation of the presence of God. Form and ritual is never going to get it done by itself. We need heaven to come down and glory to fill our souls. We need the windows of heaven to be open to shake the gates of hell. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so uh, we're, we're all too often satisfied with the conventional. Just church as usual, just come and sing a few songs, hear a little sermon and go home. It's going to take more than that. Uh, we, we accept the normal and the ordinary and the common when nowadays uh, we got to have the supernatural. If the church has ever needed it, we need it now. If the apostles worked and preached, and the Holy Ghost confirmed their word with signs following, we need it more today than they needed it then. Not minimizing them, not putting them down, not saying that they didn't need it, they did. The early days of the New Testament church were chaotic. Many of them were uh, persecuted, and, and they were imprisoned, and many were tortured, and many were killed. The church needed every help that it could get. 
And maybe we're not facing those exact circumstances right now, but we're dealing with a whole lot of other challenges. And we need God moving for us just as much as they needed God moving for them. Praise God. We're way too content with the natural progression of things when the need is greater than ever before. We need to see God moving and working in our midst like we have never seen it. Uh, this might sound like a broken record to some of you, but I'm going to say it again. Like we have never seen it. Our young people need to see it. Our children need to see it. We need to see the miracle working power of God in operation in our midst. Can I tell you my God is still a healer? That he can still heal cancers? Diabetes? Bone problems? Muscle problems? Nerve system problems? Oh, um. No, my God can still do it. He can still open blinded eyes. He can still unstop deaf ears. He can still loose the tongue that can't speak. He can still cause the lame to walk again. He can even bring the dead back to life. I'm not going to leave that in the Gospels. Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. Why shouldn't we expect this in 2023? Somebody said, well, I've heard about it for years, but I still hadn't seen it. Well, then just hide and watch, honey. Because I believe that Conyers Apostolic Church is going to see revival on a level that we've never seen before. I'm preaching this morning. You ain't seen nothing yet. Well, I've been around church for 30 years and I've never seen it on that wise. Well, then get ready to see it. Get ready to hear it. Get ready to feel it. Get ready to experience it. I preached at a meeting a few years ago, and on the way to the restaurant afterwards, I rode with a preacher that said, Brother Alvior, can I be honest with you? He said, I've been in the ministry 30-some years, and I don't think that I have ever seen what you would call a bona fide miracle. That's a tragic thing. That's a sad thing. Praise the Lord. And what he was talking about was, you know, like a miracle of healing that was just so, so undeniable, so obvious. You know, we pray for people and they get better. And, uh, and that's, you know, however God does it, it's still his work. And even if, you, even if the doctors get involved and the hospital gets involved, if God don't heal you, none of that's going to help you. Oh, I do believe that. Praise the Lord. God didn't do it. The doctors did it. No, if you got better, it's because God was kind and loving and merciful to you. I appreciate the help and advances of medicine and all of that. And I appreciate people that work in that field. They, do, they perform a, a very valuable service for a lot of people. We've got nurses here in the church too. And I think it's, uh, it's a great thing. Thank God for them. Praise the Lord. Sometimes you just need a little help, and you need it right now. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. But, but you know, only God can really heal us. And, and, and I believe God can do it gradually, but, you know, when God does it suddenly, instantly, miraculously, whew, it just blows your mind. It staggers the imagination. And there might be people sitting here this morning that are thinking right now while I'm preaching, well, you know, come to think of it, I've never seen it either. Well, get ready. This is 2023. We need God to move and we need God to work. You think it takes years to evangelize a city and sometimes all it takes is one undeniable miracle to get the attention of a whole community. 
And the next thing you know, you're putting out chairs for people to sit in because there are needs all around us. We are living in a needy world, in a hurting world, in a suffering world. I don't care if they're driving Mercedes Benz, BMWs, Lexus, or whatever it is. They, they're sick in their bodies. They got problems in their home. They got problems in their marriage. Some of them are addicted to drugs. Some of them are addicted to painkillers. They need God to set them free. They need God to work a miracle for them. And we are sitting here this morning in the church of the living God, the God that made the universe we've been talking about and I'm telling you I have not seen, ear have not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man what God is willing and able to do for them that love him. I'm going to keep preaching it and I'm going to keep believing it. I'd like to believe that right here in this house this year we could see someone who is lame walk again. Someone who is given a terminal diagnosis with cancer, get healed. And live a long life beyond that. You know, God has been working among us. God has been meeting needs. God's already working a miracle in our family that wasn't supposed to happen. When it's not supposed to happen, that's what makes it a miracle. When it can't be done with human intervention, that's what makes it a miracle. When man can't duplicate it, that's what makes it a miracle. You know, when Moses went before Pharaoh and God had at the burning bush uh, identified the staff that was in his hand, made him cast it down, turned into a serpent, then told him to pick it up. When he picked it up, it became a staff again. He went into Pharaoh's court and he performed that same act before Pharaoh and all his court. And Pharaoh said, well, that's nothing. He called his magicians and they cast uh, their staff down and they turned into a serpent. God said, watch this. And the serpent that had been Moses' staff gobbled up their serpents and became a staff again. Man can't do what God can do. He can try to imitate, but he can't duplicate what God can do. Man's intervention, praise the Lord, sometimes is needful and helpful, but only God can work in the miraculous. Only God can work in the creative. Oh, I want to believe that 2023 is going to be a better year for Conyers Apostolic Church. What would be wrong in having revivals of, of people getting healed? People all around here bringing their sick relatives. Rolling them in on wheelchairs. Maybe even on gurneys. Tubes coming out of their noses. Getting prayed for. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Many years ago, I related this before, many years ago when I was a young evangelist, I wasn't even married yet. I was, I was skinny, skinnier than anybody else here this morning. I was a skinny Young evangelist, full head of hair. And I was preaching a, in a church in the state of Kentucky. And it wasn't a big church. The pastor was pretty intimidating. Big, gruff man. And I felt that we should have a prayer and healing service that following week in our revival meeting. And it took a lot of effort for me to work up the nerve to talk to him about it. I thought he would just laugh me down or just brush the idea aside. And I said, you know what? I just feel, I finally got the nerve up and I said, I feel like we need to have a prayer and healing service this coming Friday night. To my surprise, we were in the car going down the road. Without hesitation, he said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's, let's do it. Let's announce it. So we announced it. The place was full. It was packed out. We preached because I believe that preaching is still the catalyst. 
They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word. You can't get the cart in front of the horse. And there were people there that were visitors, that, that were sinners, that were unbelievers. They didn't know anything about God. They needed to hear the word of God. I, I don't believe in these healing, and camp, these healing campaigns where they never preach the gospel. People need healing, but they need salvation more than anything. And so I preached, and then we had a, uh, uh, at the end of the service, or at the latter part of the service, we had everybody line up that wanted to get prayed for. And me and the pastor just anointed them with oil and prayed for them as they went by. And we did this for a while, because I think just about everybody went through the line. And you know what? And, and I say this without any hesitation, uh, because we were able to verify it later. It's the truth. Everybody who came through that line that night got their healing. Everybody. There was a young girl who was, nearly, who was legally blind. Her glasses were so thick, they looked like those old pop bottles, you know, made your eyes uh, look uh, abnormally large, and she couldn't see anything without them. Everything was just, uh, just a blur. And... Uh, we didn't know this. We didn't even see. And the young girl, uh, before she came through the line, had taken the glasses off on her own. Now, I wear glasses, and a lot of you wear glasses. I'm just telling you what happened that night, okay? She, her faith was that God was going to heal her. She took the glasses off. Nobody even noticed before she came through the line. And she came through the line, and we prayed for her. She went home that night, and without her glasses in dim lighting, could read fine print and didn't have to wear glasses again. God healed her. But what was most dramatic was a couple that brought a child. It was an 18-month-old uh, little boy. That had, uh, that, that had convulsions so bad. He had seizures so bad. I don't know what, what the name of his condition was, but he would have multiple seizures every day. And they had to have a rotating cast of friends and relatives that would be with the child 24 hours a day because when the seizures would come and he would convulse, he would try to swallow his tongue. And it was, it was just horrible, horrible. He had never tried to sit up. He had never smiled. He'd never done anything that a child 18 months old by then has done. Had never tried to stand, had never tried to crawl. He was just like a little human vegetable. The mother was a head nurse in a large hospital in Kentucky and had seen the baby, had had the baby seen by doctors all around that she knew. And all the specialists and nobody had been able to help that baby. And we didn't know this when they came through the line. It was just, you know, visiting people that were there holding this child. And we prayed for the little boy. Now remember, I'm just a young evangelist. I'm maybe 20, 21 years old. That's all I was. And me and the pastor are praying. We didn't feel anything. There was no flash of lightning. There was no sound of thunder. We didn't hear an angel choir singing. We just prayed for the child and went on to the next one. Amen. We were sitting at the table in the pastor's house the next day when the telephone rang. And it was the man that had brought this couple to the service that night before. And he was so excited. I could actually hear his voice, though he was talking to the pastor. I could hear, overhear the conversation. And he was so excited. So the, the couple went home and the little boy started to have one more seizure and abruptly stopped. And he said, Pastor, he's sitting up in his crib. He's smiling. He's trying to pull himself up. He's doing what he had never done before. I was able to follow up with that some 10 or 11 years later. He was a perfectly normal young boy. God totally healed him that night. Do it again, Lord. I came to tell somebody you ain't seen nothing yet. You think you've seen it all? You think you've heard it all? You think you've felt it all? God's about to do things that'll blow your mind. Come on, somebody ought to praise him here today. Why don't we stand right now? Come on, let's keep praising him as we stand.
You know the rest of the beauty of that story is when the word got around town of what had happened. We broke that church's record attendance two days later on Sunday morning. There wasn't room to set everybody. Because again, there's a hurting, sick, troubled world all around us. And they need the power of God in their lives. And I'm going to say it again. God is still a healer. In fact, he can heal somebody right here, right now. He can heal what I'm talking. He can heal while I'm preaching. He can heal somebody watching and listening to this service online right now. In the next few moments, God can heal. If you're skeptical, go ahead and be skeptical. If you don't want to believe, go ahead and stay in your unbelief. But my belief is that God can and God will. And we could go on and on and tell, relate story after story. And some of you that have been in church uh, for a length of time, you've seen them, you've heard them, you know about them. But we need it on a level that is unprecedented. And again, the main thing, even though God is a healer, the main thing is the gospel. The main thing is the message. And there is a miracle that is greater than a cancer being healed. There's a miracle that's greater than epilepsy being healed. There's a miracle that's greater than blinded eyes seeing. It's when the spiritually blind... It's when people that are bound by sin, dope addicts, alcoholics, people tormented with spirits come in and get delivered. That's a miracle too, my friend. The miracle of salvation, the miracle of redemption, the miracle of sins being forgiven and washed away in a watery grave of baptism. The miracle of God filling people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and turning their life around. Why shouldn't we expect revival in our day? The same God that created the universe created the church. And I believe he has equipped the church with every resource necessary for us to succeed in our times. I'm tired of casinos and sports arenas prospering and being packed out while the church struggles to survive. We can see this church packed out. We're not after numbers, we're after souls. We want to see lives changed, transformed, set free, redeemed. Families put back together. Marriages put back together. Kids that are on drugs set free by the power of God. We need to see former dope heads and dope pushers up here worshiping, shouting, rejoicing. Tattoos all over their bodies. Piercings all over their bodies. Not still, but you know, former. Hallelujah. Shouting and worshiping and glorifying God. That's miracles too. Tired of the charismatics and compromising compromising churches being the only ones growing. Well, we fight for every soul and every gain. It's always going to be a fight. But if God could do it on the day of Pentecost, he can do it in 2023. If he could do it in the book of Acts, he can do it in 2023. Either it's possible, either it's true, Or the Bible is a fallacy and a book of fairy tales. But I believe this Acts 2.38 message still works. Repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Ghost can still set the captives free. I said it can still set the captives free. It still has the power to change lives in marvelous ways. Can anybody believe with me today? You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. So they come up and get ready to sing in just a few moments. 
Let me just say this. I grew up on the mission field. My father was a missionary. I grew up on the streets of Sao Paulo, Brazil, one of the largest cities in the world with a metro area population of over 20 million people in one city. It's a concrete jungle. Amen. And our churches were small and ramshackle. And we didn't have much. But I grew up in an atmosphere and an environment of revival. And it was not unusual in any service, no matter what day of the week it was, to see somebody come in devil-possessed, get set free. You don't have to believe that. That's what I grew up in. Praise the Lord. The, Brazil is the largest Catholic country in the world. And over 60% of those, maybe even 70, are spiritists also. They worship devils, as I've told you before. Many of them don't worship devils because they love them, but because they fear them. They're hedging their bets. They worship God at the cathedral, and then they have their seances and their uh, spiritism rituals on the side to keep the devils happy and keep the devils away from them. And a lot of them are bound by that. Witchcraft is all around. Sorcery all around. People bound by those things. And a lot of times before somebody could receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they had to have the devils cast out of them. Because the Holy Ghost isn't going to co-inhabit a heart that has the devil in it too. They're not going to share occupancy. they got to be delivered first. And as a child, I grew up, and, you know, there were a lot of services that were interrupted by the hideous screams and the shrieks and the outcries of the devil possessed that would fall out on the floor and begin to writhe around and squirm and tear at their clothes and, and scream profanity and try to harm themselves and people around them. Many a service was interrupted by the preacher having to go down and lay hands on them and cast the devils out. I hardly ever remember an altar service where people came up to the front and had people pray around them while they sought the Holy Ghost in my early days. They, you know, now you see a lot of them, but in my early days, I don't remember much of that. People received the Holy Ghost right where they were standing during the worship service, during the preaching of the Word of God. People that had been told all their life they could only get to God through a priest or through Mother Mary. Not trying to offend anybody here today, but you can go straight to the master. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He's the savior. He's the deliverer. He's the one that went to Calvary. He's the one that shed his blood. When they realize that they can talk to him directly, see those hands come up and tears flow down their face. And see them repent and break through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the environment I came up in. And I'd like to believe now in the last years of my life in ministry that I can see that in an even greater scale. Because the need is greater. The challenges are greater. The problems are greater. So I'm standing here today, amen, up in my 60s telling you, you ain't seen nothing yet. As they begin to sing, why don't we, some of us, just make our way up to the front and worship the Lord here today at the close of this service believe God for help in your situation believe God for healing in your body believe God for a change in your life praise God come on let's do it with faith let's come like expecting people
God is up to something today. Can you believe it?